you're invited to step back in time some 4,000 years to explore the ancient land of the Bible, what we now call the Middle East, and to meet legendary people whose stories have influenced millions of lives throughout history. Reader's Digest brings you Great People of the Bible. You'll see how God leads Abraham to his ultimate test of faith. Will he sacrifice his son at the Lord's command? You'll meet Abraham's son Isaac, whose twin sons Esau and Jacob in a lifetime of conflict battle for their birthright and their father's blessing. And you'll meet Jacob's handsome and compassionate son Joseph, sold as a slave into Egypt by his brothers who eventually becomes one of the most powerful men in the court of Pharaoh. These are tales of intrigue full of twists and turns, lies and deceptions, drama and passion. They are an integral part of history's most revered work of literature, the Bible. First, the story of Abraham and Sarah. We'll travel from the ancient Babylonian city of Ur, which is in modern-day Iraq, north to the city of Haran, in the region we now call southern Turkey, and then finally south into the land of Canaan, today part of Israel and Lebanon. This episode marks a great turning point in biblical history as God singles out one man and his family to receive his special revelation, care, and promises. What was so special about Abraham and Sarah, who were chosen to give birth not only to a great nation, but also to one of the most inspirational spiritual revolutions of all time? Actually, Abraham and Sarah were quite human, and even though he questioned and from time to time challenged the will of God, Abraham continued to exhibit faith gratitude, and a unique loyalty to God on such a monumental scale that he deserves to be called, as he is, the father of us all. Our story begins in the city of Ur in what is today Iraq. Here is where Abraham and Sarah spent their early years, about 2,000 years before the birth of Christ. The concept of one God had not yet been widely accepted, and they were surrounded by people who worshipped idols. In his waning years, Abraham's father, Terah, decided to move from Ur to the land of Canaan. So he took with him Abraham, Sarah, and his grandson Lot. They first traveled northward some 500 miles to Haran. Today, Haran is called Tel El Mugayar in southeastern Turkey. They settled there, and that is where Terah died. As the years went by, Abraham and Sarah lived an ordinary pastoral life, but there remained a tremendous void in their lives. They were never able to have children. When Abraham was 75 years old, God challenged him to his first test of faith. In Genesis 12, 1, the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great. Abraham left his homeland in Haran to embark on a treacherous journey of some 400 miles south to the land of Canaan. His faith was strong, and he did as God commanded. With no maps to guide him and not knowing the languages, he had to barter for provisions as he traveled through strange and sometimes hostile lands. When the caravan reached Canaan, God once again appeared, and in Genesis 12, 7, the Lord said to Abraham, To your offspring I will give this land. Abraham continued his journey through the land of Canaan to the Oak of Moreh at Shechem and to the mountains to the east of Bethel, where he built altars, a tribute to his faith in God. As time passed, however, Abraham's faith appeared to waver. 
Here he was, as God had led him, in a foreign land surrounded by pagans, and he and Sarah still childless. How was he to give this land to his offspring when he didn't have any land and he didn't have any children? And to make matters even worse, a severe famine swept through Canaan. Abraham and Sarah could not survive if they were to remain in Canaan. Not waiting for any divine message, Abraham took Sarah and Lot and the rest of his household and went down to the more fertile land of Egypt where there was sure to be food. Before entering Egypt, Abraham had known about the killing of husbands and the kidnapping of wives. Not yet ready to trust completely in God's promise to ensure his safety, that evening Abraham devised a plot that may very well have saved his life. He told Sarah, You are a beautiful woman, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife, and they will kill me, but they will let you live. Tell them instead, You are my sister. Just as Abraham had feared, the caravan was stopped as they entered Egypt. And when the officials of Pharaoh saw Sarah, they were impressed with her beauty and took her into Pharaoh's household. She was prepared for her introduction. When she was presented to Pharaoh, he was taken with her exotic appearance and the fact that she was a stranger in his land. Of course, he had no idea that she was the wife of Abraham. Pharaoh had been told she was unmarried, and he took her for his wife. What was Sarah to do? She could not protest, for to do so she would have endangered Abraham. As time went on, the pleased Pharaoh rewarded Abraham with generous gifts. gifts of camels, sheep, oxen, slaves, and donkeys. But then, Pharaoh and his entire household suddenly became deathly ill. Because of his sin with Sarah, the Lord had afflicted Pharaoh and his people with great plagues, even though Pharaoh had no knowledge that Sarah was indeed Abraham's wife. The hurt and angry Pharaoh summoned Abraham and blamed him for the plagues. What is this you have done to me, he cried. Why did you not tell me Sarah was your wife? Why did you say she was your sister so that I took her for my wife? Here is your wife then. Take her and be gone. It was a wealthier and more prosperous Abraham who took his family and returned to the land of Canaan. By then, Abraham and Lot, who was with him, owned so much cattle that their herdsmen were fighting each other for choice grazing lands. In a generous gesture befitting the benevolence of a true patriarch, Abraham took Lot to a point overlooking the land and said, let there be no strife between you and me and between your herders and mine, for we are kindred. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the land to the left, then I will take the land to the right. Or if you take the right, I will go to the left. The young Lot chose the better site, the rich and fertile land of Jordan, described in the Bible as well watered everywhere, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt. So Lot settled among the cities of the plain and moved his tent as far as Sodom, and Abraham settled in Canaan. In Genesis 13, 14, the Lord said to Abraham, Raise your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land that you see, I will give to you and to your offspring forever. I will make your offspring like the dust of the earth, so that if one can count the dust of the earth, 
your offspring also can be counted. Rise up, walk through the length and breadth of the land, for I will give it to you. Abraham led his household through the land of Canaan and eventually set up his tents in Mamre as he was commanded by God. Here Abraham built an altar to the Lord. It was there that this patriarch of peace was drawn into battle in the valley of Sidim, in the area near the southern end of the Dead Sea, near the peninsula of Al-Isan, a mighty war was being waged. The armies of the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah were routed by their enemies. The people of Sodom and Gomorrah fled to the hills, while the enemy took all their goods and provisions. And along with them, they took Abraham's nephew Lot as a prisoner. One of the soldiers who had escaped came and told Abraham that Lot had been taken captive. That night, Abraham assembled the men of his house, according to the Bible, 318 of them, and took off after the enemy. Abraham's army caught up with them, and under the cover of darkness, they attacked. The surprised enemy was routed and defeated. Abraham rescued Lot and brought back all the goods that had been taken. For his heroism and his deeds in battle, Abraham was honored and blessed by Melchizedek, the king of Salem, an early name for Jerusalem, who is referred to in the Bible as a priest of God Most High, and Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. But when the grateful king of Sodom offered to let Abraham keep all the goods he had recovered in battle, Abraham declined. He took nothing. He said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord, God most high, maker of heaven and earth, that I would not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours, so that you might not say, I have made Abraham rich. That night, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision. In Genesis 15:1. The Lord said to Abraham, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. Look toward heaven and count the stars. If you are able to count them, so shall your descendants be. Whether it was impatience or a lack of faith, Sarah decided to take matters into her own hands. At that time, Sarah had an Egyptian slave girl named Hagar, and Sarah decided that Abraham should take her as a concubine to produce an heir. Sarah said to Abraham, You see that the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my slave girl. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. So after Abraham had lived ten years in the land of Canaan, Sarah took Hagar, her slave girl, and gave her to her husband Abraham as a wife. And when Abraham was 86 years old, Hagar bore Abraham a son. They named the child Ishmael. Thirteen years later, when Abraham was 99, God once more appeared and repeated his promises to Abraham. This time, however, he also added a ritual requirement. In Genesis 17, 4, God said, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you and I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land where you are now an alien, all the land of Canaan for a perpetual holding. Every male among you shall be circumcised when he is eight days old, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Any uncircumcised male shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. At the same time, God also told Abraham he would give him a son by Sarah, Abraham fell down laughing. He said to himself, How can a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? How can Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child?
Abraham then pleaded that God might recognize his son Ishmael. Ishmael. Oh, that Ishmael might live in your sight. In Genesis 17, 19, God replied, No, but your wife Sarah shall bear you a son, and you shall name him Isaac. As for Ishmael, I have heard you. I will bless him and make him fruitful and exceedingly numerous. He shall be the father of twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear you at this season next year. That very day, Abraham, with his son Ishmael, and all the men of his household were circumcised. Sometime later, as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day, Abraham looked up, and three men suddenly appeared in front of him. Abraham ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. In the tradition of Eastern hospitality, Abraham brought them water so they could wash their feet and had Sarah and his servants prepare food for the visitors. Abraham set food before them and they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. The men then set out for Sodom, and Abraham went with them to show them the way. As the men turned and headed for Sodom, Abraham remained and spoke to the Lord. The Lord explained to Abraham that there was a great outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah for their wickedness and sin, and he had come to judge them. Abraham then fulfilled God's promise that he would be a blessing even to other nations. He stood before God and questioned his decision to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. If there was even a small number of God-fearing people could not the sinners be saved? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then destroy the place? And the Lord responded to Abraham, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will forgive the whole place for their sake. Then Abraham continued to bargain with God. Will you destroy the whole city if you find 45 righteous people? God answered, no. Abraham persisted. How about 40? How about 30? How about 20? And then, perhaps remembering he was indeed arguing with the Almighty. Oh, do not let the Lord be angry if I speak just once more. Suppose 10 are found there. Abraham's argument convinced the Lord, and the Lord promised Abraham, for the sake of 10 righteous, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went up from Abraham. That evening, as the two angels arrived in Sodom, Lot, Abraham's nephew, was sitting in the gateway. He greeted them and urged them to wash and rest and feast in his home, which they did. But before they could lie down to rest, all the men of the city, young and old, surrounded the house and shouted to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we may know them. Lot stood his ground and confronted the crowd and said, I beg you, my brothers, do not act so wickedly. Look, I have two daughters who have not known a man. Let me bring them out to you and do to them as you please. Only do nothing to these men, for they have come under the shelter of my roof. But the mob would have none of that. Stand back, they yelled. This fellow came here as an alien and he would play the judge? Now we will deal worse with you than with them. Then they pressed hard against Lot and came near the door to break it down. 
But the angels of the Lord stood before the crowd, and they struck with blindness the men who were at the door of the house, young and old, so that they were unable to find the door. Then the angels of the Lord told Lot the outcry against Sodom had become great before the Lord. Take your family out of this place, for we are about to destroy it. When morning dawned, the angels once again urged Lot, saying, Get up, take your wife and your two daughters, or else you will be consumed in the punishment of the city. When they were outside, the angel said, Run for your life, flee to the hills, and do not look back or stop anywhere in the plain. For if you look back, you will perish. Then the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah sulfur and fire from out of heaven, and he destroyed those cities and all the plain and all their inhabitants, and everything that grew on the ground. Lot, his daughters, and his wife struggled to escape. But Lot's wife behind him could not resist the temptation. She looked back and became a pillar of salt. Early the next morning, Abraham went to the place where he had stood before the Lord, and he gazed down toward Sodom and Gomorrah and the plain, and all he could see was the smoke rising, as it is described in the Bible, like the smoke of a furnace. Lot escaped to the hills and lived in a cave with his two daughters. Worried that they would have no children, the older daughter said to the younger, Come, let us make our father drink wine, and we will lie with him, so that we may preserve offspring through our father. So they made their father drink wine that night, and the older daughter went in and lay with her father. He did not know when she lay down or when she rose. On the next night, they also made Lot drink wine, and this time, the younger daughter lay with her father. Both the daughters of Lot became pregnant by their father. The older bore a son named Moab, who is the ancestor of the Moabites. The younger bore a son named Benami, who is the ancestor of the Ammonites. The Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son, and Abraham gave him the name Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac when he was eight days old, as God had commanded him. Abraham was 100 years old. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast. On the night of the celebration, when Sarah saw Abraham's son Ishmael playing with Isaac, she became jealous and said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for he shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. Abraham was caught between the love for his wife and the love for his son. God's voice came to Abraham and told him to do as Sarah had asked. It is through Isaac, God said that offspring shall be named for you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar. He sent her away along with Ishmael. They wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she left the boy and sat down opposite him a good way off, for she had not the heart to listen to his cries and watch him die. Do not let me look on the death of the child, she cried. 
God heard the cries of Ishmael, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened Hagar's eyes, and she saw a spring of water. She took some in her hand and gave Ishmael a drink. Ishmael and Hagar survived their banishment. Today, Muslims trace their ancestry to Abraham through Ishmael. The pain and suffering of Ishmael and Hagar pale by comparison, however, to the ordeal that Abraham suffered when God challenged Abraham with his cruelest test of faith. In Genesis 22, 2, the Lord said to Abraham, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. What must Abraham have felt? Should he obey God's command to slaughter his son? He dutifully saddled his donkey and took his son Isaac and two of his young men. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and went to the place that God had shown him. On the third day of their sad journey, they reached the place God had chosen for the sacrifice. Abraham told the young men traveling with them to stay with the donkey, while Abraham and Isaac went ahead to worship. We will come back to you, said Abraham. Abraham carried the fire and the knife while Isaac carried the wood. When they reached the spot, Abraham erected an altar. Isaac questioned his father. The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham then responded with the heart-rending words, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. When Abraham had completed the altar, he seized his son Isaac and tied his limbs together as he would ritually tie the limbs of a sacrificial animal. He laid Isaac on the pyre. He then reached out, and without revealing his feelings, he raised the knife and prepared to kill his son. Only then did the angel of the Lord intervene. Abraham, Abraham, he called. And Abraham responded, here I am. The angel of the Lord said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son your only son from him. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you, and I will make your offspring as numerous as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your offspring shall all the nations of the earth gain blessings for themselves, because you have obeyed my voice. Genesis 22, 15. The story of Abraham and Sarah ends, and the story of Isaac, Jacob, and Esau begins in the land of Canaan, in the land we now call Israel. Scholars of the Bible often compare the life of Isaac with the life of Jesus, their miraculous births, and their unquestioning obedience at the time they were called upon to be sacrificed. Here is where those extraordinarily similar events took place. In Bethlehem, Jerusalem, Mamre, and Moriah, separated by 2,000 years and less than 50 miles. According to the Old Testament, Isaac's mother, Sarah, 
died when she was 127 years old in Hebron, in the land of Canaan. Abraham, Isaac, and her loved ones mourned and wept and buried her in a cave facing Mamre. Three years later, when Isaac was 40 years old, Abraham ordered his oldest, most trusted servant to find a wife for Isaac. In the tradition of the times, Abraham had him place his hand under his thigh and made him swear by the Lord that he would not choose a wife for Isaac from the Canaanites among whom they were living. Instead, Abraham wanted his servant to go back to Abraham's ancestral lands in Padan Aram, where he might find a more suitable wife for Isaac. But suppose the woman doesn't want to follow me back here, asked the servant. Shall I take Isaac back to your homeland? No, you must promise me that you will not take Isaac back there. And Abraham explained that if the woman was unwilling to follow him, the servant would be free from the oath he had sworn. The faithful old servant then took ten of his master's camels, loaded them with beautiful gifts, and set off for the city of Nahor, which is close to Haran. He reached the outskirts of the city toward evening and had his camels kneel down beside the well of water. The women of the town were already out to draw water from the well. The servant prayed, asking for some sign from the Lord that would help him choose a wife for Isaac from among those women. O oh Lord, he said, I am standing here by the spring of water, and the daughters of the townspeople are coming out to draw water. When I say, please, let me sip a little water from your jar, let the one you have chosen for Isaac say, drink, and I will water your camels also. Even before he had finished praying, the beautiful Rebecca, daughter of one of Abraham's nephews, appeared with a water jar on her shoulder. The servant went to meet her and said, Please, let me sip a little water from your jar. He wondered if she was the woman God had chosen to be the wife of Isaac. Then Rebecca answered. She answered with a sign from God. Drink, my Lord, and I will draw water for your camels also. The servant knew then that God had chosen Rebekah to be the wife of Isaac and asked if there was room for him to spend the night in her father's house. <laughs> Rebekah ran home and told her brother Laban what had happened. and Laban returned to the spring to invite the stranger and his party into their home. Before they ate, the servant told Rebekah's family that he had been sent by Abraham to find a wife for Isaac, and recognizing that the servant was blessed by the Lord, they agreed to let Rebekah leave with him. The next morning, Rebekah and her maids prepared for the long trip back to Canaan. Then they mounted the camels and went with the servant to meet Isaac. Isaac was settled in the Negev and happened to be out for a stroll in the field. When he looked up, he saw camels approaching and went to meet the caravan. When Isaac and Rebekah saw each other for the first time, it was love at first sight. She slipped quickly from her camel and whispered to the servant, Who is that man over there, walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, That is my master, Isaac. Rebekah quickly covered herself with her veil as was proper for a maiden. The servant then introduced Rebekah to Isaac and told him everything that had happened on his trip, how he prayed for a sign from the Lord, and how the beautiful Rebekah gave him that sign. Rebekah and Isaac fell very much in love and were married, and there was a great celebration. In Genesis 24, 67, 
the Bible tells us. Then Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent. He took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Abraham lived to the age of 175, as the Bible describes him, an old man and full of years. His sons, Isaac and Ishmael, came together for the last time to bury their beloved father in the cave of Machpelah, in the field east of Mamre, where they had buried Sarah. After Abraham died, God blessed Isaac, and Isaac and Rebekah settled at Beer Lahai Roy. After 20 years of marriage, Rebecca finally became pregnant. Rebecca was having difficulty conceiving a child, but Isaac prayed to the Lord, and the Lord answered his prayer, thereby perpetuating the family of Abraham. Rebecca's pregnancy was extremely difficult. She had conceived twins, and the children within her were scuffling even before they were born. This was distressing to Rebecca, who said, if it is to be this way, why do I live? In Genesis 25, 23, the Lord explained to Rebecca, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples born of you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The elder shall serve the younger. And when her time came to give birth, the first twin was born covered in red hair. The second child emerged holding on to his brother's heel. The first child they named Esau. And the younger they named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when his sons were born. As the boys grew, Esau learned to be an outdoorsman and a skillful hunter, while Jacob was more of a shepherd and herder. Esau became his father's favorite, and Jacob was his mother's. And as the years went by, the brothers grew their separate ways, and when they were young men, something happened that drew them even further apart. One day, when Jacob was cooking a stew, Esau staggered back from the field, exhausted and starving. Let me eat some of that red stuff, for I am famished, said Esau. And Jacob said, first, sell me your birthright. Jacob was demanding that Esau turn over to him whatever might become his as Isaac's firstborn. The famished Esau agreed to the sale with the words, I am about to die, of what use is a birthright to me? Swear to me first, insisted Jacob. And Esau swore to him. Only then did Jacob offer him food, and only later did the full effect of this oath become apparent. When a famine came to the land, Isaac considered going to Egypt, where he knew there would be food, as his father Abraham had done before him. He traveled as far as Gerar, but then Isaac received his first vision. In Genesis 26, 2, the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Settle in the land that I shall show you. Reside in this land as an alien, and I will be with you and will bless you. For to you and your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will fulfill the oath that I swore to your father Abraham. So Isaac trusted in the word of the Lord and settled in Gerar, the land of the Philistines. When the men of Gerar asked him about Rebekah, he was afraid to say she was his wife. Because she is so attractive, he thought, the men might kill me for her sake. 
so he told them she was his sister. When Isaac had been in Gerar a long time, one day King Abimelech looked out and saw Isaac caressing Rebekah. He called for Isaac and said, So she is your wife. Why then did you say she was your sister? Isaac then explained that he was fearful that if he said she was his wife, he might be killed for her sake. Bimelech was upset with Isaac. What have you done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. But sensing the hand of the Lord, Abimelech warned all the people, whoever touches this man or his wife shall be put to death. The Lord blessed Isaac so abundantly that his crops reaped a hundredfold, and he became very wealthy. From there, Isaac went up to Beersheba, where the Lord appeared to him. In Genesis 26, 24, the Lord said to him, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not be afraid, for I am with you and will bless you and make your offspring numerous for my servant Abraham's sake. In Genesis 27, 1, we read of Isaac as old and rather feeble. His eyes were dim so that he could not see. He called to his firstborn and favorite son, Esau, for he wanted to give him his blessing to understand the full impact of this story. It is important to know that according to ancient belief, blessings or curses were powerful acts because they had the power to produce the intended results. A blessing, once given, could neither be withdrawn nor given to another, for it came from God. Here is where God's prophecy to Rebekah before her sons were born is fulfilled. The elder shall serve the younger. Isaac told Esau to take his weapons and hunt game, and then prepare a savory dish for him before he gave him his blessing. Rebekah overheard Isaac's instructions to Esau and quickly devised a plan so that Jacob, her favorite son, would receive the blessing from Isaac. She told Jacob to choose two choice kids from the household flock and bring them to her so that she might prepare savory food for Isaac. She then explained to Jacob, you shall take it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob was fearful that his father would see through the deception. Look, he said, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am a man of smooth skin. If my father were to feel me, he would know I was Jacob, not Esau, and he'd bring his curse upon me rather than his blessing. Let your curse be on me, she said. Obey my word and get them for me. And so it was that Jacob got them, and Rebekah prepared savory food, just as Isaac loved. For his disguise, Rebekah took some of Esau's finest clothes and put them on Jacob. She put the skins of the kids on his wrists and hands and on the smooth part of his neck. When Rebekah was satisfied that Jacob would appear hairy to Isaac, she handed him the savory food she had prepared. Jacob entered the tent and called to his father. My father, he said. Who are you, my son? asked the old man. I am Esau, your firstborn. I have done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my gain so that you may bless me. Isaac was suspicious. How is it you hunted the game and cooked it so quickly, my son? And Jacob answered, because the Lord your God granted me success. Come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether or not you are really my son Esau. So Jacob went up close to him. Isaac felt his hands and said, The voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. Are you really my son Esau? And Jacob answered, I am. He then gave his father the food and wine, and his father ate and drank. Shana. After having eaten, Isaac said to Jacob, Come near and kiss me, my son. Jacob came near and kissed him, and Isaac smelled the smell of Esau's clothing. 
And now, convinced he was Esau, he gave Jacob his blessing. <laughs> No sooner had Isaac finished blessing Jacob than his brother Esau returned from his hunting. When Esau went into his father with the food he had prepared, Isaac asked, Who are you? Esau answered, I am your firstborn son, Esau. Isaac then realized he had been deceived, and he asked Esau, Who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me before you came, and I have blessed him? Yes, and blessed he shall be. When Esau heard his father's words, he cried out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry and pleaded with his father, Bless me, me also, father. But Isaac said, Your brother came deceitfully, and he has stolen your blessing. He has supplanted me twice, cried Esau. First he took away my birthright, and now he has taken away my blessing. Have you not reserved a blessing for me? Then Isaac answered Esau's plea. I have already made him your lord, and I have given him all his brothers as servants with grain and wine to sustain him. What then can I do for you, my son? Have you only one blessing? cried Esau. Bless me, me also, father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. There was nothing Isaac could do. The deed was done and Esau had lost the blessing he should have received as the firstborn son. Now Esau hated Jacob for what he had done, and Esau vowed that once his father died, he would kill Jacob. Esau's threat reached Rebekah, and she explained to Jacob, your brother is consoling himself by planning to kill you. She then instructed Jacob to flee at once to Haran, where he could stay with her brother Laban, until Esau forgets what you have done to him. Then I will send for you and bring you back from there. Why should I lose both of you in one day? Then Isaac called Jacob and once again blessed him and ordered him not to marry any of the Canaanite women, but to go at once to Padan Aram and take one of the daughters of Rebekah's brother Laban as a wife. Jacob then left Beersheba and headed toward Haran, and it was on this journey that he experienced an astonishing heavenly vision. He had traveled about 12 miles in the wilderness to the north of what is now called Jerusalem. When the sun had set, he chose a place to rest, and he picked up one of the stones for a pillow, put it under his head, and fell asleep. He dreamed there was a ladder suspended between heaven and earth, and the angels of God were ascending and descending on it, and the Lord stood beside him. And in Genesis 28, 13, he said to Jacob, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie, I will give to you and to your offspring, and your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east, and to the north and to the south, and all the families of the earth shall be blessed in you and in your offspring. Know that I am with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he said, How awesome is this place! This is none other than the house of God! This is the gate of heaven. He anointed with oil the stone upon which he had slept, setting it apart for God's use, and named the place Bethel, meaning house of God. He also vowed to give God one-tenth of his earnings, or a tithe, if he were, as God had promised, to return safely to Canaan. Jacob continued on his journey, and as he came close to Haran, he saw a well in a field with three flocks of sheep lying there beside it. There was a huge stone on the mouth of the well, and in the evening, 
when all the flocks were gathered, the shepherds together would remove the stone, water the sheep, and then replace the stone. The shepherds were from Haran, and they indeed knew Jacob's uncle Laban. In fact, Laban's daughter Rachel was just arriving at the well with her father's flock. When Jacob first caught sight of his beautiful cousin Rachel, he didn't wait for the other shepherds. Alone, by himself, he rolled the stone from the well and watered the flocks. Oh! Rachel was immediately taken with the stranger, as he was with her. Could this be the woman from Haran that Jacob would be taking for his wife? <laughs> Jacob ran to Rachel and kissed her. He explained he was her father's relative, and she ran home to tell him. Jacob stayed in Laban's home and worked with him, and after a month, Laban said to him, Just because you are my kinsman, should you therefore serve me for nothing? Tell me what your wages should be. Now Laban had two daughters. The beautiful Rachel was the younger, and the less attractive Leah was older. And Jacob had fallen in love with Rachel. So he made a bargain with Laban. I will serve you seven years for your younger daughter Rachel. And Laban agreed. The seven years seemed to Jacob but a few days because of his love for Rachel. And after the seven years had passed, he went to Laban and said, Give me Rachel as my wife, that I may consummate my marriage with her. Laban agreed and prepared a huge feast. On the wedding night, there was great joy and celebration. There was music, dancing, and lavishly prepared food and wine. During the ceremony, in the tradition of the times, the bride was veiled, and what Jacob did not realize was that Laban had tricked him. Behind the wedding veil was not Rachel, whom he loved, but Leah, her sister. For seven years, Jacob had dreamed about this day, and he was perhaps the most excited of all who had come to celebrate with him. He ate and drank and danced and partied through the day and on into the night, not for one moment did Jacob suspect that Laban would deceive him. He had no reason to doubt that he was marrying his first love, Rachel. And on his wedding night, he thought he had taken Rachel into his tent. Jacob did not discover until the next morning that he had consummated the marriage, not with Rachel, but with her older sister, Leah. He was devastated. What is this you have done to me, cried Jacob to Laban. Did I not serve you for seven years for Rachel? Laban calmly explained that local custom required that the older daughter be married first. However, he told Jacob if he would finish the bridal week with Leah, he would give him Rachel, if he would serve him for another seven years. Jacob agreed. After the week with Leah, Jacob married Rachel, and served his uncle another seven years. <laughs> Leah, the unloved wife, proved to be fertile, while the much-loved Rachel did not conceive for many years. Leah had four sons, Reuben and Simeon 
and Levi and Judah. But like Sarah and Rebekah before her, Rachel also had difficulty conceiving a child. Since she failed to bear children, she became envious of her sister and offered her maidservant Bilhah to Jacob that she may have children through her. Bilhah conceived and gave birth to Dan and then a second son, Naphtali. And when Leah ceased to have children, she offered her maidservant Zilpah to Jacob. And she bore Jacob two sons, Gad and Asher. Leah then bore two more sons, Issachar and Zebulun, and a daughter, Dinah. Then finally, God remembered Rachel. He heard her prayers, and she bore a son, and this child they named Joseph. All told, 11 of the 12 ancestors of the 12 tribes of Israel were born during Jacob's 20 years of exile. Benjamin was yet to be born. After Joseph was born, Jacob spent six more years working for Laban. He was awaiting his mother's message that it was safe to return to his homeland, and he wanted to provide for his own household. For his wages, Jacob made an unusual request of Laban. In Genesis 30, 31, Jacob says, You shall not give me anything. Let me pass through all your flock today, removing from it every speckled and spotted sheep and every black lamb, and the spotted and speckled among the goats, and such shall be my wages. Laban agreed to the bargain, and Jacob left reassured. Once again, however, Laban tried to deceive Jacob. As soon as they parted, Laban had his sons remove every one of those animals from his flock. This time, Jacob realized he was being cheated, and he had to protect himself from Laban and his kinsmen. God was watching over Jacob, however, and he saw to it that despite Laban's underhanded ways, Jacob's flocks grew larger and stronger, and Jacob became prosperous. The more prosperous he became, the more envious Laban and his kinsmen became. In Genesis 31.3, the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your fathers where you were born, and I will be with you. Jacob then told Leah and Rachel about his plans to leave Laban. He also told them about a dream he had in which the angel of God said, I have seen all that Laban is doing to you. Leave this land at once and return to the land of your birth. Trying to avoid a confrontation, while Laban was away shearing sheep, Jacob fled Padan Aram with his wives and children and servants and livestock and all his possessions. Before they left, and unbeknownst to anyone else, Rachel stole her father's household idols, which were precious to him, since they ensured his leadership of the family. She hid them in the saddlebags of her camel. Three days later, when Laban returned, he was furious. He pursued Jacob for seven days and finally caught up with him in the hill country of Gilead, west of the Euphrates River. Jacob and his people feared for the worst. They prepared for battle, but there was none. Laban had come in peace. He was not looking for a fight as much as he was looking for an explanation. Not only was Laban insulted that Jacob had left secretly, not even allowing him to kiss his daughters and grandchildren goodbye, but he was further upset by the idea that Jacob had stolen his teraphim, the images of his household gods. Jacob was indignant at having been accused of stealing the idols. He not only swore he didn't have the idols, but he also promised he would kill anyone found with them. He invited Laban to search the camp. When 
Laban came to Rachel's tent. She was sitting on the camel bags where she had hidden the idols. Rachel pleaded that she could not rise, for the way of women was upon her. So despite the search, Laban never found his idols. Afterwards, Jacob and Laban made a pact of peace. The following day, Laban kissed his daughters and grandchildren goodbye, and the two men and their parties went their separate ways. Even though he had avoided a battle with Laban, Jacob still had his brother Esau to deal with. He decided to send messengers ahead to Esau in the land of Seir, the country of Edom. He told them to tell Esau that he had been living with Laban as an alien and had been detained there until now. When the messengers returned, they told Jacob that Esau was fast on his way to meet Jacob, and he was coming with 400 men. Jacob panicked. He and his party were no match for 400 men, and he was afraid that Esau would kill them all. He did what he could. First, he sent lavish gifts to Esau including hundreds of sheep and goats and scores of cattle and camels, hoping to appease him. And at the same time, he moved his household and remaining goods to a safer place, back across the Jabbok, a tributary of the Jordan River. One of the most baffling stories in the Bible occurs when Jacob was alone that night on the bank of the Jabbok. He found himself wrestling in the dark with a mysterious stranger. Religious scholars for generations have debated the significance of this wrestling match. Does it symbolize the Israelites' persistent struggles with the Lord and the divine blessing it earned? Is it the battle every human must undergo with the forces of evil? In any event, Jacob and the stranger wrestled until the break of dawn. And when the stranger saw that he could not bring Jacob down, he struck Jacob's hip at its socket and sprained it. Nevertheless, Jacob eventually dominated the struggle. At daybreak, the man said, let me go. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. In Genesis 32, 28, the man replied, you shall no longer be called Jacob. But Israel, for you have striven with God and with humans, and have prevailed. Before the sun rose, the stranger left. As Jacob limped away, he realized he had come face to face with God and survived. To this day, many Israelites do not eat the thigh muscle that is on the hip socket, for that is where Jacob was struck. Jacob rejoined his family, but he still remained fearful as his brother and his men kept getting closer. Esau and his men were now within sight. Jacob called his family together. Fearful that they would not survive a battle with Esau, he motioned them to stay back. When Esau came closer, Jacob bowed to the ground seven times. The two brothers who had not seen each other for over 20 years approached each other. Jacob's fears of Esau were unfounded, for his forgiving brother ran joyously toward him, embraced him, and kissed him. Esau asked Jacob what he meant by sending all those gifts. And Jacob replied, to find favor with my Lord. But Esau said, 
I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. But Jacob insisted, and Esau finally accepted the gifts. That day, Esau returned to Seir. And Jacob continued to Sukkoth, where he set up his tents and made pens for his cattle. Many years later, Jacob finally arrived safely at Shechem in the Promised Land, the land of Canaan, and he set up camp within sight of the city. He bought land from Hamor, the prince of the city, so that his people could live there in peace and harmony. And he set up an altar to the God of Israel. When Dinah, the daughter of Jacob and Leah, went out to visit some of the women of the land, Hamor's son, Shechem, seized her and raped her. When Jacob heard that his daughter had been defiled, he held his peace until his sons returned home from the fields. When they heard their sister had been raped, Jacob's sons were angered and seethed with indignation. Shechem's behavior was an outrage and could not be tolerated. Hamor tried to appeal to the sons, telling them that Shechem had his heart set on marrying Dinah. And then Shechem himself appealed to Jacob and his sons, telling them no matter how high they set the bride price, he would pay whatever they asked. Only give me the girl to be my wife. We cannot do this thing, replied the brothers, to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace to us. Only on this condition will we consent to you, that you will become as we are, and every male among you be circumcised. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and be gone. The men of the town agreed with the conditions, and every able-bodied man in the community was circumcised. On the third day, when all the men of the town were still in pain, recovering from their circumcisions, Dinah's brothers Simeon and Levi, two of Jacob's sons, took their swords and advanced against the city without any resistance, and they massacred every male. They killed Hamor and his son Shechem and took Dinah from Shechem's house. Then the other sons of Jacob followed up the slaughter and continued to sack the city of Shechem. They seized all their flocks and herds, carried off all their wealth, their women and their children, and took whatever was in the houses. No man was left alive, and nothing was left standing. Jacob was gravely disturbed. He told Simeon and Levi they had brought great trouble to him and his family by making them odious to the inhabitants of the land. My numbers are few, he said, and if they gather themselves against me and attack me, I shall be destroyed. But the two sons continued to defend their action, arguing, should our sister be treated like a whore? Shortly thereafter, Jacob left Shechem, and in Genesis 35:1, the Lord said to Jacob, Arise, go up to Bethel and settle there. 
Make an altar there to the God who appeared to you when you fled from your brother Esau. So Jacob and all his people journeyed to Bethel in the land of Canaan. There, on the site of the vision of the angels on the ladder, he restored the altar he had built 20 years earlier. Once again, God appeared to Jacob and blessed him. In Genesis 35, 9, God said to Jacob, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall you be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. I am God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you. The land that I gave to Abraham and Isaac I will give to you, and I will give the land to your offspring after you. Even after all these years, Isaac was still alive, and Jacob decided to visit him. On the journey, Rachel went into labor, not far from Bethlehem, where 2,000 years later, and just a few miles away, Jesus was born. Rachel never reached Mamre with Jacob. While giving birth to Benjamin, her second son, she died. <laughs> Jacob continued his sad journey. Soon after he arrived in Mamre, his father, Isaac, also died. He was 180 years old. Esau and Jacob, his twin sons, buried him and never saw each other again. Except for his final years, Jacob lived the rest of his life in Canaan. In modern times, the name given him by God reappeared. In 1948, when the Jews of Palestine declared their independence, they named their new state after Jacob. They named it Israel. Now the story of Joseph and his brothers, which takes us from Israel to the land of Egypt. Joseph was the son of Jacob, grandson of Isaac, and great-grandson of Abraham. He was born in Israel some 200 years after the birth of Abraham but his adventures took him south on a perilous journey to Egypt. Unlike Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Joseph never talks directly with God, but instead receives the Lord's messages through dreams, which were in those days considered divine communications. The story is an exciting tale of Joseph the dreamer, of Joseph of the splendid coat, how Joseph's brothers wanted to murder him, and then sold him into slavery. And how Joseph survived and eventually became, other than the Pharaoh, the most powerful man in Egypt. When Joseph was 17, he was still living with his father Jacob and his 11 brothers. As you remember, Jacob had 12 sons, six by his first wife Leah, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun. Two sons by Leah's maid, Zilpah, Gad, and Asher. And two sons were by his second wife, Rachel's maid, Bilhah, Dan, and Naphtali. After years of not having children of her own, Rachel, Jacob's first love, gave birth to Joseph, who became his favorite. Benjamin, his twelfth son, was born later. One day, when Joseph returned from the fields, he reported to his father that his brothers had been doing evil things, which only fanned the fire of their jealousy. 
Except for Benjamin, the brothers already disliked Joseph because he was their father's favorite son. To symbolize his favored position in the family, Jacob had made Joseph a beautiful coat of long sleeves, the coat of many colors. In such a coat, Joseph could not do manual labor as his brothers did. They wore only the drab, sleeveless coats of common shepherds, while Joseph's long coat was a constant reminder that their father loved Joseph more than he did them. Their dislike grew to hatred. Throughout history, Joseph has been referred to as the dreamer, and dreams in those ancient biblical times had far more significance than they do today. Many people believed it was one important way in which the supernatural world communicated with us, a way that God talked to people. This was extremely important in the life of Joseph. One day, he was out in the field with his brothers when he had a dream. In Genesis 37, 6, he told his brothers, Listen to this dream that I have dreamed. There we were, binding sheaves in the field. Suddenly, my sheaf rose and stood upright. Then your sheaves gathered round it and bowed down to my sheaf. And his brothers said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Are you indeed to have dominion over us? And so they also despised him because of his dreams and his words. <laughs> then Joseph had another dream in which his brothers all bowed down to him. And when he told it to them, their hatred grew to rage. So it was that when they were out tending the flock one morning and they saw Joseph approaching in his elegant coat, they said, let's kill him and get rid of him once and for all. But Reuben, the eldest brother, argued, no, let's not kill him. Shed no blood. Why don't we just throw him into this dry well here in the wilderness? Reuben's plan was that when the brothers had all gone, he would come back and rescue Joseph and return him to his father. So that's what they did. They grabbed Joseph and tore off his coat and threw him down the deep pit. Sometime later, when Reuben was away, the other brothers saw a caravan of Ishmaelites approaching. And Judah said, what's the profit in slaying our brother? After all, he's our own flesh. Why don't we just sell him to the Ishmaelites? They all agreed and hauled Joseph out of the well and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. Then they decided to cover up their crime by killing a goat and dipping Joseph's beautiful coat in the blood to make it look as though Joseph had been killed by a wild animal. When the brothers showed the bloody coat to Jacob, he was convinced that his beloved Joseph had been devoured by a wild beast. As the Bible tells us in Genesis 37:34. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. Thus his father wept for him. <laughs> 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 
Dio pensiona! What Jacob did not know, however, was that Joseph was not dead. The Ishmaelites had taken him down into Egypt and sold him to Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's guard, to be a slave in his house. God, however, continued to watch over Joseph, as we learn from Genesis 39 2. The Lord was with Joseph, and his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hands. So Joseph found favor in his sight, and he made him overseer of his house, and put him in charge of all that he had. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing was upon all that he had in house and field. Now Joseph was handsome and good-looking, and after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, Lie with me. But Joseph refused and said to his master's wife, Look, with me here my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything he has in my hand. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept back anything from me except yourself, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great wickedness and sin against God? But Potiphar's wife kept after him day after day. He tried his best to ignore her, not to speak to her. One day, however, when he was in the house working and there was no one else around, she caught him and held on to his garment and commanded him once again to come lie with her. He tore away from her and fled, leaving his garment in her hand. Potiphar's wife was furious with Joseph's rejection, and she was determined to punish him. She screamed for help. See, my husband has brought among us a Hebrew to insult us. He came in and tried to lie with me, and when I screamed, he fled. But he left his garment behind. She told Potiphar the same story when he came home, and Potiphar became enraged. He called his men and threw Joseph into the great prison where Pharaoh's prisoners were held. And there Joseph stayed, but he was not alone. The Lord was with him, as we are told in Genesis 39, 21. The Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love. He gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's care all the prisoners who were in prison, and whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The chief jailer paid no heed to anything that was in Joseph's care, because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Sometime after this, two new prisoners arrived. One was the chief cupbearer of the Pharaoh, and the other was his chief baker. They had somehow angered the king, and he had sent them to prison. They had been turned over to Joseph, who was charged with taking care of them because they were important officers. One night, both of these new prisoners had troubling dreams, all the more troubling since dreams were considered messages from God. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were upset and asked them why they looked so downcast. They told him that they had dreams, but they had no one to interpret them. And Joseph told them, with God's help, he would interpret their dreams. The chief cupbearer told him that he had dreamed of a vine with three branches and that the branches blossomed and then ripened into clusters of grapes. One 
He said that Pharaoh's cup was in his hand and that he took the grapes and pressed them into the cup and gave it to Pharaoh. Then Joseph told them that the vines meant three days and that within three days he would be restored to his former position as chief cupbearer. And Joseph said, when they release you, please remember me, mention me to Pharaoh and try to get me out of here, for I have done nothing that they should keep me in this dungeon. When the chief baker heard the favorable interpretation of the cupbearer's dream, he was eager to tell his own dream. In his dream, there were three cake baskets on his head, and the top one was full of all sorts of baked goods for Pharaoh. But the birds came along and ate them. And Joseph said, this is the interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree and the birds will eat the flesh from you. Three days later, it was Pharaoh's birthday and he made a great feast for all his servants. The chief cupbearer and the chief baker were brought out of prison and knelt before him. He restored the chief cupbearer to his former position and he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But as Joseph had predicted, he condemned the chief baker to death. And the birds gathered to eat his flesh. Joseph, meanwhile, remained in prison. The cupbearer had forgotten Joseph's request. One night, two years later, Pharaoh had a dream which awakened him. But he went back to sleep. And that same night, he had a second dream. In the morning, the two dreams troubled him so much, he sent for all the magicians and wise men of Egypt to explain what the dreams had meant. But none of them could interpret the dreams. It was then that the chief cupbearer remembered Joseph. He told Pharaoh about the young Hebrew slave in prison who could interpret dreams. Pharaoh sent for Joseph. And when Joseph appeared before him, Pharaoh said, I hear you can interpret dreams. Joseph again explained that his power to interpret dreams came from the Lord. It is not I, he said. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said, I dreamed I was standing on the banks of the Nile and saw seven sleek fat cows grazing on the reeds, and seven gaunt, thin, starving cows came up and ate the seven fat cows. In my second dream, I saw seven ears of grain, full and good, growing on one stalk, and seven ears withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind, sprouting after them, and the thin ears swallowed up the good ears. 
And Joseph explained, Pharaoh's dreams are one and the same. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. There are seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. And after them, there will arise seven years of famine, and all the plenty will be forgotten. The famine will consume the land. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God, and God will shortly bring it about. Then Joseph told Pharaoh that he should appoint a wise and discreet man and make him overseer of all the land. This man would have the power to take one-fifth of all the grain during the seven years of plenty and stockpile it to be used during the seven years of famine. Pharaoh thought that would be a good idea, and he also believed that Joseph was the perfect man for the job. He took off his signet ring and placed it on Joseph's finger. And he gave him Asenath, the daughter of a high priest, to be his wife. Joseph was 30 years old, and at that time, with the exception of Pharaoh himself, there was no one in Egypt more powerful. As it happened, events turned out exactly as Joseph had foreseen. In the next seven years, there was a bountiful harvest every year, and the granaries were full to overflowing. As the Bible says, full beyond measure, thanks to the foresight and diligence of Joseph. So also was Joseph's life full beyond measure. He had gained great prestige, great wealth, and Asenath had given birth to two sons. Joseph, however, took no credit for his great success. In Genesis 41, 51, Joseph says, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. God has made me fruitful in the land of my misfortunes. And then, as Joseph had predicted, after seven years of plenty, there then came seven years of famine, not just in Egypt, but throughout the world. Joseph continued to be in charge and oversaw the distribution of grain to the starving people. Not only was there enough grain for the Egyptians, but there was enough to be sold to other people as well. As the Bible says, all the earth came to buy grain from Joseph. including, of course, Joseph's brothers. When Joseph's father, Jacob, heard that there was grain to be had in Egypt, he sent his ten oldest sons down there to buy it, for the famine had also severely struck the land of Canaan, and Jacob was desperate. He kept Benjamin, his youngest son, by his side because he was afraid that harm might come to him on the journey. When they arrived in Egypt to buy grain, the ten sons of Jacob were taken before the all-powerful Joseph. And they knelt down before him. This fulfilled the dream Joseph had had years earlier. They, of course, did not recognize Joseph as the brother they had sold into slavery. Joseph, however, recognized them immediately, but he did not let them know it. He spoke harshly to them and treated them like strangers. He turned his back to them as they pleaded with him to sell them grain. He even accused them of being spies. They denied it vehemently and tried to explain to him who they were, that their aged father Jacob was back in Canaan with their youngest brother, and they desperately needed to buy food. <laughs> 
Joseph pretended he did not believe them and threw them into prison. Three days later, when he felt that they had suffered enough, he went to them and offered them a bargain. I will put you to a test, he said. I will sell you the grain, but you must leave one of you here as hostage. Return home and come back with your younger brother, and I shall know you are telling me the truth, and you shall not die. The brothers agreed to do this and argued their predicament among themselves. They did not know that Joseph understood their language since he had always spoken to them through an interpreter. Reuben said that what they were going through was punishment for what they had done to their brother Joseph so many years ago. Did I not tell you not to wrong the boy? But you would not listen. Now comes the reckoning for his blood. This was too much for Joseph and he turned away from his brothers and wept. Then he returned to them and picked out Simeon as a hostage. He allowed them to be given grain and he sent them on their way. When they got back to Canaan, they told their father what had happened to them in Egypt. He was in despair. In Genesis 42, 36, Jacob cries out, I am the one you have bereaved of children. Joseph is no more, and Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin. My son shall not go down with you, for his brother is dead, and he alone is left. But when the grain they had brought from Egypt ran out, and the famine was still severe in the land, the old patriarch realized he had no choice. He would have to send them back to Egypt for more grain, and he would have to send Benjamin with them. When the brothers arrived in Egypt and once again stood before the mighty Joseph, their reception was entirely different. Joseph was delighted to see Benjamin with them, and he ordered his steward to take them to his house and slaughter an animal, and he would dine with them at noon. The steward took the men to Joseph's great house, and he brought Simeon out of prison to be reunited with them. Joseph joined them at noon and asked them about their father and paid particular attention to his younger brother, Benjamin. They still did not recognize Joseph as their long lost brother. According to the Bible, they drank and were merry with him, a far cry from the harsh and hostile treatment they had experienced before. Then Joseph commanded his steward to fill their bags with food as much as they can carry. He also took his own silver cup and told the steward to secretly place it on top of the grain in Benjamin's sack. By morning's light, the brothers were on their way home.
They had traveled only a short distance when they were overtaken by Joseph Stewart, who accused them of stealing Joseph's silver cup. He challenged the brothers. Why have you returned evil for good? Naturally, the brothers were amazed and vehemently denied it. Why should we do such a thing, they said. If it be found with any of us, let him die. Moreover, the rest of us will become your slaves. So be it, said the steward. He who has it shall be my slave. The rest of you shall go free. The steward began searching each man's sack, starting with the oldest. The last sack the steward searched was Benjamin's. And there, of course, he found the silver cup. Seeing this, the brothers cried out and tore their clothes in despair. How could they ever explain this to their father, Jacob? They loaded up their donkeys and returned to the city. They stood in fear before the now stern Joseph, who said, What deed is this that you have done? Judah stepped forward and pleaded eloquently with Joseph, telling him about his father and his love for Benjamin, the only remaining child of his old age. He ended his plea by asking Joseph to let him stay as his slave and let Benjamin go back to his father. Judah's plea was too much for Joseph. He could not keep up his charade any longer. He cried out and sent all the Egyptians out of the room. And he wept so loudly that all the Egyptians could hear him, and also the household of Pharaoh. The brothers were dismayed at this. But Joseph said, with great compassion and understanding in Genesis 45, 4. Yes, sir. I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are five more years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. <laughs> When Pharaoh heard that Joseph had been reunited with his brothers, he was very pleased. He said to Joseph, Tell your brothers to load up their donkeys and go back to the land of Canaan and get your father and all his household and come to me, and I will give them the best land in Egypt, and they will live off the fat of the land. You must set up. When they returned home and Jacob heard the whole story, that his son Joseph was alive and the governor of all Egypt, he was stunned 
and at first he didn't believe them. But when he saw all the wagons Joseph had sent to carry them back, he rejoiced and said, Enough! My son Joseph is still alive! I will go to see him before I die. So Jacob set out for Egypt with 70 members of his household and all their belongings and livestock. They stopped in Beersheba to offer a sacrifice to God. And that night, God made Jacob a promise that has become central to the history of the Hebrews. In Genesis 46, 2, God says, Jacob, Jacob, I am God, the God of your father. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you a great nation there. I myself will go down with you to Egypt and I will also bring you up again. When Jacob and his large family arrived in Egypt, Joseph presented him to Pharaoh, and Jacob blessed Pharaoh, and Pharaoh was as good as his word. He instructed Joseph to settle his father and his brothers in the region of Goshen, which is a fertile area in the northeastern part of the Nile Delta, and see that they had food and anything else they needed. Jacob and his people prospered there, and they were fruitful and multiplied, and Jacob lived in Egypt for 17 years. During that time, Joseph became even more wealthy and powerful. By trading grain for land and services, he effectively abolished private property and established a kind of feudal system that was very profitable for the pharaohs and for Joseph himself. Then one day, he received the sad news that Jacob was dying. He took his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and went to his father's bedside. Then Jacob blessed Joseph and his two boys. Jacob then called all his other sons around him, and he blessed them also. And then, surrounded by the men after whom the 12 tribes of Israel were named, the patriarch Jacob breathed his last. He was 147 years old. Joseph and Benjamin and all their brothers took their father's body back to the land of Canaan, and they buried him in the cave at Mamre. There at Mamre, Jacob, 
his father Isaac, and his grandfather Abraham would remain together for eternity. Joseph returned to Egypt, where he had a large family of grandchildren and great-grandchildren. He lived to be 110 years old, and when he died, he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. <laughs> 